So chemical compound formulae. Okay, so we're going to look at how we actually write chemical formulae and how we actually represent chemicals using their chemical symbols and other numbers and things like that. So the basics of chemical formulae. Correctly representing these chemical compounds with a formula is an important skill. Okay, so using form a formula to represent a chemical is a skill that all chemists need to know, otherwise you won't be able to communicate with other chemists. Now what this requires, in order to learn this skill, you have to have learned your valencies very well. So when I was in high school, my chemistry teacher always stressed how much we had to remember our valencies. This is why it's important, because if you don't know your valencies, you'll never be able to get the right formula for the right chemical. This sentence is of key importance to you guys. So remembering that we have ionic, covalent, metallic structures and all these other things, we're going to just focus on each section in order to better understand how to write chemical formula for one section. So we're going to look at how to write an ionic formula first, and then we'll look at covalent ones later. Firstly, you have to identify what the component elements are. Okay, So if yellow was, say, chlorine, and green was, say, sodium, it should actually be the other way around, but anyway, let's just go with that, just for argument's sake. Then we need to know what's there. So we know that it's chlorine and sodium. Okay, so that's the first step. Okay, just identifying what we actually have in this, so in the actual compound. So it's an easy one. Then you have to determine the valency of each component. And we know we can do this using the periodic table. Or if your memory is really good, maybe your teacher has given you a table of valencies and you just remembered them all. You can use the periodic table, or but some of those polyatomic ions like carbonate or nitrate, you'll have to just remember off by heart. Okay, so then we multiply the number of components so that the final compound is electrically neutral. Okay, so this is a complicated one, and it of course doesn't super, like make a lot of sense right now, but basically your ionic compound will be electrically neutral from far away. So if I was to hold a piece of salt and look at it, it would I would see it as an electrically neutral piece of salt. Okay, so if I brought like for instance just say some very positively charged wire near my salt in my hand, then you wouldn't see like the salt moving because it doesn't react to that electricity. That's what we mean by electrically neutral. And I'll explain how we get this part when we go through the example. But all we have to know for now is that we have to make sure that this unit here, our formula unit, is electrically neutral. Okay? We can't have a charged formula unit, otherwise that doesn't make sense. So here's our example. Magnesium, which is Mg, hopefully you know this, and chlorine are reacted together. So you react these two things together. Determine the chemical formula for, of the resulting ionic compound and write a balanced equation for this reaction. Fairly standard question. So first, okay, we've already identified, so we don't really have to worry about that now because we know it's magnesium and chlorine. So we'll determine the valencies first. So if you look up the periodic table, you'll see in group 2, magnesium is there. So you know magnesium has a valency of plus 2. And if you're looking for chlorine, it's in group 7, so you know that chlorine has a valency of negative 1. Okay, so we should remember this from all our study of the periodic table so far. Okay, and the final form of the compound is magnesium with some number, some number of magnesium atoms, and some number of chlorine atoms combined together. Okay, and we need to figure out what X and Y are. So is it Mg2Cl1, or is it Mg5Cl50, or is it you know, MgCl, just 1 and 1? That's our job to figure this out. And that electrically neutral part is where, how we'll work this out. And magnesium is written first simply because it's the metal. So you write, so the one that comes first is the one on the left hand side, and the one that comes second is furthest to the right hand side of the periodic table. Okay, so to work out x and y, we find the lowest common multiple of the charges in terms of absolute value. So don't worry about the signs. So if, for instance, chlorine is negative 1, but we're just going to say 1 at this point. And then multiply the charges by the appropriate number to achieve that value. So the lowest common multiple, we had magnesium has a valency of 2, and chlorine has a valency of 1, or negative 1, but we're taking the absolute value, so it's just 1. And so the lowest common multiple is 2. For magnesium to have a charge of 2, it's just charge times x equals 2. So obviously the charge is 2, so 
so x equals 1. So we know the charge is 2, and x has to be 1 in order for that e to equal 2. Now similarly for y, you've got the charge of the chlorine ion times however many chlorine ions per molecule, or per unit, to give you 2. So you've got a charge of 1, then to get to 2 you need y to be equal to 2, so y equals 2. Therefore, the final form is magnesium 1 chlorine 2, so MgCl2. And you can see that if we have this Mg2 plus and Cl minus, if we were just to put them together straight away, you would have MgCl plus. You see there's the charges don't go to zero. And that's why we needed two Cl ions for every one Mg ion. So you can see that from the electrically neutral Okay. And the final equation then would be MgCl2, remembering that chlorine exists as a diatomic gas, that goes straight to MgCl2. Okay?